Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple data points, use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor is with us this week in Florence, Italy. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, we have two topics for you this week. In the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about steel, specifically U.S. steel, and a potential takeover of that company in the United States. But first, we wanted to talk about an event that is coming up next week, namely the World Economic Forum at Davos. The data point there is 54. It is the 54th annual meeting in that small Swiss village where the world's elites have been gathering for decades to discuss their mutual interests and how they align with the interests of the rest of the world. To Davos, where many of the world's richest and most powerful people, the majority of whom are men, convene for a week-long... The most complicated geopolitical backdrop to date, its president, Borch Brand, said... We talked about Davos last year. We thought we'd take another look at what exactly may be going on this year. So, yeah, Adam, first, a general question. I'm not sure it came up when we talked last year. As I was thinking about it, I, I was wondering what your thoughts are about what exactly gets accomplished at these meetings at Davos in the first place. I mean, there always is a kind of agenda that they set, but I'm curious how substantive the discussions really are, or would it be more correct to think of this as a kind of coordinating function that Davos has. It basically gathers people together, the attendees, and tries to get them on the same page about what the issues are and what to kind of think and say about them. I mean, so yeah, are they actually tackling problems or are they just kind of coordinating about them? Yeah, there have been occasions in the past, if you look back at the history of the WEF meetings, the World Economic Forum meetings, where it served as a a way station for various types of, you know, shuttle diplomat and for backroom diplomacy. It was a place where regional rivals could meet in the, there were meetings during the Cold War. And at the end of the Cold War, there were meetings between the Palestinians and various other Middle Eastern interests at various points. I've seen meaningful exchanges between foreign ministers take place in closed door meetings at Davos, where it was quite clear that both sides were surprised that they were able to talk in the way that they were. I don't know what came of those exchanges, but they seem, you know, to all intents and purposes to be very genuine and and quite surprising to the participants on both sides. There is a, an entire level of the Davos Conference Center, which is devoted to so-called bilateral meetings between the privileged members of the World Economic Forum. So these are the corporations that pay as members and whose subscriptions sustain the the event. Uh, an awful lot, I think, of quite significant deal making goes on there. It's a convenient place to meet because everyone will be there. And so you're not having to schedule rather public bilateral meetings. Very canny hedge funds, for instance, track the movements of senior managers involved in potential buyouts. And so it's easier to spot that kind of thing going on if it's bilateral, whereas if everyone just happens to be at Davos, it's it's easier to obscure. But I think increasingly the main function of it is to serve as a sort of platform for a kind of signaling, a kind of elaborate PR exercise, if you like. I think there is a certain amount of coordination that goes on between corporations where you can see groups forming around agendas for you know projects like uh, greening particular industries but i think in the in the vast majority of cases what's really happening here is presence flags being flown essentially at a at an annual event where it's important to be present and where your absence might be noted as a in itself a significant fact about how you want to position yourself in the world I'm not going, for instance, this year. And I do wonder about, you know, the effect of this on, you know, my perception in the circles of people that do attend that kind of event. Like, I, uh, do you, what happens if you miss out? What happens if you're not there? What happens if you're not in the lobby? Are you still part of the scene? And, uh, you know, I, I, so, so I wonder, I imagine corporate managers feel the same way about the presence of their businesses. Well, I, I imagine they're listening to this podcast. That's what I'm. That's well, what, that's I, what assume, I'm imagining. Course, yes. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the way you describe it, that to the extent there is a substantive agenda, or when 
substance happens, it's in the form of deal making. I mean, as well, opposed to conversations, kind of like coordinating your position, checking in with somebody as to like you know how they view the situation discreetly and off the record. And yet, you know, in terms of the self presentation, there's a kind of intellectual pretension that is also apparent in the framing of these event as well. Where, but, you know, uh, who's kidding who? This isn't, it's not an academic seminar, ultimately. Uh, it truly and- isn't. This is a misunderstanding. It absolutely, absolutely isn't. It's very unlike Jackson Hole. I mean, I did a piece for Foreign Policy a while back comparing them. Jackson Hole is an academic conference that central bankers go to and monetary economists give papers. And, you know, it's, it's a huge status signal for an academic monetary economist to give a paper at Jackson Hole. Absolutely not the case at Davos. A handful of academic sort of people do get invited, but on the terms of the WEF and their budget for that kind of thing is actually quite restricted. What the WEF itself does do, and I use their graphics regularly, is compile really quite good data on a variety of themes they're interested in, globalization, the energy transition, problems of poverty and inequality at times, global health. You know, they have that agenda, which the kind of 90s, early 2000s agenda of globalization, and they their staff do produce a lot of really worthwhile data compilations but they're not a they're not a think tank in you know the classic sense of a brookings or Bruegel in europe or something like that well the davos conference does have an official theme it does every year and this year's is uh, quote rebuilding trust uh which Strikes me could be a theme that is a sort of perennial one at Davos. Uh, you know, um, trust being the kind of currency that the folks at Davos would probably want to maintain. But I'm curious, as far as you can tell, you've been there before in, in recent years, in fact. So, I mean, what is the prevailing analysis of how trust was lost in the first place? Yeah, I was looking back and I think trust was also, or rebuilding trust, maybe in so many words, was actually also the theme in May 2022, which was a momentous Davos for me. I, and that was in the wake of the, you know, Russia's uh, aggression against Ukraine. And and uh, it was quite paradoxical, actually, because WEF's lurching commitment to the Ukrainian cause, for obvious reasons, and um, it's a European organization, broadly speaking, and this became very, very clear in that context, which, as we know, divided the world, not, I think, on matters of principle, but there was large parts of the world that didn't want to line up with the rather Cold War hawkish kind of position that WEF and Davos was actually taking. So I've never seen trust eroded quite so dramatically as it was amongst the members, or at least significant numbers of the members of WEF at that event where building trust was the the theme. I think the fundamental issue with Davos is they love words like trust. They love words like confidence, governance, leadership, and so on. But what they are leery about facing and talking about and addressing straight head on is really what that has to be built on and why it might be lost. And there is a temptation to focus on issues of procedure, on matters of communication, of presentation and so on, and a leeriness about talking about fundamental conflicts, uh, matters of distribution and matters of hierarchy. So power is presumed, leadership is presumed. The question then is, how does it get trust? But the fact of leadership and of power and of hierarchy and of privilege and of inequality, those facts in and of themselves are harder for a forum like Davos to really open up and address squarely. And so it's really a, there's that famous event where they were talking about inequality, but managing somehow not to talk about tax. So it's, I think, an inherently problematic situation. And and in a sense, that's part of the paradoxical element of Davos. I think it functions best when it doesn't have to engage in this kind of rebuilding. When it's trying to do the rebuilding, it's really not a forum terribly well positioned, qualified, equipped, or peopled, if you like, to do that work. Because it really is essentially, despite their efforts to invite a kind of bouquet of outsiders, civil society groups, and so on, it's fundamentally a paying members driven corporate chindig into which politicians also like to attend and some policymakers and think tankers and folks like myself who get invited along as intellectual adornments and op-ed writers and so on. And so that's not really the foundation on which you can engage in collective societal trust building, much as that group in particular would love to assume that was there. Yeah, it does seem like Davos is the expression of this win-win worldview where there are no losers uh, and there don't have to be any losers. And yeah, if anything, that's, I suppose, 
an expression of the ideology of globalization in its heyday. Uh, kind of world is flat, we're all, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, etc. Obviously, uh, these days, a lot of commentators are talking about deglobalization, a kind of more, uh, yeah, kind of uh, opposing sides in the world as geopolitical tensions rise. And given all that, I'm, I'm curious whether Davos is even the most important global gathering at all in the world these days, or whether instead the other big conference that happens early in the year, namely the Munich Security Conference, which is a gathering of uh, national security officials primarily in the West, whether that's in fact the more important geopolitical, but maybe even also economic conference in the world these days. I'm sure the Munich people think so. The sort of um, meme used to be that, you know, Munich is the the Davos for serious people. It's a, it's an interesting contrast because the Munich event is is older, uh, founded in 63, 1963, under the, under the rather, rather different sounding title of the Münchner Wehrkundetagung or Internationale Wehrkundebegegnung. And Wehrkunde is, is, uh, has a distinctly military tinge to it. It was the creation of a survivor of the anti-Nazi resistance movement, an officer, the son of a, a clan of officers, the, the extraordinarily named Ewald Heinrich von Kleist-Schmenzin. And it had about it, I think, a strongly Atlanticist feel from the beginning and perhaps has sort of somewhat made some effort to water that down since. Putin, for instance, made a very famous speech at the Munich conference in 2007 in which he basically announced the new confrontational position that Russia was going to take towards the West. But I think the Munich conference has always had slightly more that feel. In other words, it's an event of Atlanticism, NATO plus Japan, which is attended by invited guests from the rest of the world who then use it either to confront or not to confront the West. Whereas Davos's ambition is truly that of a kind of global forum, which it periodically and in recent events, notably around Ukraine, has slid from, slid away from into a much more confrontational position, which, as I was saying, is actually rather uncomfortable for many of the people who attend it. Whereas I think if you go to the Munich Security Conference, you pretty much know what you're letting yourself in for, which is a Western centric. It's a place that, you know, congressional delegations attend in much greater force and much greater regularity than they do. They do Davos nowadays. John McCain used to be a regular there, even when, you know, um, the, the Democrats were, were in office. So it's a place where a bandwidth of American opinion on Atlanticism expresses itself very vocally because it is ultimately centered on issues of security. You're completely right that those, of course, in the current world spill over very forcefully into the economic realm. And to that extent, in a sense, what the world needs right now is some sort of merger of the two of the two events. Uh, maybe it could be, uh, you know, <laughs> Munich would certainly more be more convenient than Davos as a, as a venue, not quite as picturesque. But, uh, but yes, they are striking the two of them, both German foundations ultimately, though Davos is of course hosted in in Switzerland. And of this moment of first wave globalization, detente, 60s, 70s, international and economic and geopolitical um, negotiation. Well, we uh, you know wish everyone well at the Davos conference next week, but we have to take a break right here. We'll be back in a second to talk about US Steel. Hi, and welcome back. Our next data point is $14.1 billion. That is the size of the takeover bid made by Nippon Steel, the Japanese company for U.S. Steel, the storied steel company based in the United States. That deal is now under review by the Biden administration, which finds itself under pressure to block the takeover both on national security grounds, but also on broader economic grounds. We thought we'd take a closer look at what exactly is at stake here. So Adam, yeah, maybe just a basic question first. I'm curious, why is Nippon Steel in the position to take over U.S. Steel in the first place? I mean, why are they the stronger company? What have they been doing right versus U.S. Steel? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's a basic question, but it's also it's a kind of question that feels as though it comes a little bit out of a time warp because Nippon Steel has probably been a stronger company than U.S. Steel for maybe half a century. Japan, the surge in Japanese steel production in the 1960s is one of the great epics of modern industrialism. It's what the original Asian Japan scare was fundamentally driven by. It then, of course, spills over into automaking and shipbuilding and so on. But it starts with a huge surge in Japanese steel production half a century ago, in fact, 60 years ago. By the late 1960s, eight of the 10 largest blast furnaces in the world were already located in Japan in the late 1960s. By the 1980s, the average size of a Japanese blast furnace was twice that of its European or American counterparts. And this matters because steel is a volume business and the larger your plant, the more the greater economies of scale scale that you get. And the Japanese just blew everyone out of the water and they blew everyone out of the water. Not recently. This isn't some China shock story. You know, but half a century or more ago. Today, just to put things in perspective, of the top 15 global steel producers, there is only one American and it's in the 15th position and it isn't US steel, it's Nucor. US steel ranks at the 27th position in the global hierarchy of steel makers. Nippon steel is in fourth position. All of the rest of the top 15 are uh, Chinese, overwhelmingly, South Korean, Japanese or um, Asalor Mittal, which is a European Indian conglomerate dominated by Indian capital. So sort of for America to suddenly waking up in a panic and discovering that its storied quote unquote steel industry is the object of a kind of casual takeover by the Japanese. It's as though, what have you been doing the last half century? Of course, uh, America's steel producer is essentially just a flotsam in the larger scale. And we're talking huge differences. The top Chinese producer produces 10 times as much steel as US steel. Um, Nippon steel produces four times as much as US steel. The question we should really be asking ourselves is why on earth is Nippon steel interested in buying and also RAM in the global steel industry? And I think it's a complicated calculus. They see the US, the US market is interesting. US market is a very large market for high quality steel. Um, they see the subsidies that are available for making steel in the US. And a Nippon is playing on the global level. And in the global level, the US market is just part of its global puzzle. It's increasingly difficult for them to export to China. They fear carbon taxes in China. They're a heavy carboniferous. They use a lot of coal in making steel in Japan. They haven't found any good solutions for that yet. They're looking for alternative ways to position themselves. They're in a much, much more important strategic alliance with Asalor Mittal, with the Indian producer, which is really where they see the future. And this American play is kind of hedging their bets. So no one should exaggerate the significance of this for Nippon as well. The offer they made was twice as good as the the, the competing offer made by, by an American competitor. So they're valuing the assets quite highly, but one shouldn't exaggerate the significance of this for them. Um, it's part of a big global puzzle in which the US is a, not a backwater exactly, but it's not and has not been for decades at the forefront of the global steel industry. So then what do you make of the national security argument that's being made in the United States for preventing this takeover? I mean, what role does ready access to steel even play in national security in the first place? Yeah, I mean, the administration is playing this hard. I mean, the Lael Brainard, right, who is the national economic advisor, and she's a very, very, very smart economist, uh, like said... The president believes U.S. steel was an integral part of our arsenal of democracy in World War II and remains a core component of the overall domestic steel production that is critical to our national security. And you really have to ask yourselves, you know, have you no shame? I mean, seriously, have you no shame? I mean, it's an absurd on its face, risible argument and being invoked for evidently political reasons in the current situation because they're desperate for the labor vote. They're unwilling to make an offensive case for this partnership. But think, you know, analytically about this, what actually does, you know, Japanese ownership of a US steel producer threaten? I mean, so there's presumably two issues that you would worry about. One is access to steel, and the other one is some sort of technological argument. But no one in their right mind can imagine that US steel has anything to teach Nippon steel about making steel, right? I mean, if there's anything at stake here, it's a technology transfer from Japan to the United States. 
which might conceivably heave this relatively backward American producer into the 21st century and certainly has made much more aggressive moves, say, on green steel under pressure than the US producers have. So the technology argument is is sort of just, well, it's, it's, it's impossible to make it. So talk about quantities of steel. Part of what makes this plausible right now is we've got this war in Ukraine. And so people are talking about ammunition and about tanks. And so this conjures up all of this talk about the arsenal of democracy. And presumably for an arsenal, you need steel. And in World War II, when we were doing a total war at a global scale and America was supplying heavy equipment to the entire world, US steel production was indeed stretched and was a backstop. But think about the dimensions of this right now. So 155 millimeter NATO standard artillery shells are the big bottleneck right now. And we're talking about Ukraine needing hundreds of thousands of them. Ideally, it would have a million or two. So how much steel goes into one of these? So I did the math on this. 155 millimeter artillery round weighs 43 kilos. If you subtract the explosive, the fuse and everything else, I think you're probably on the high side if you think it needs 30 kilograms of steel per shell. So assume you made a million rounds, which is far more than anyone in the West is immediately thinking about being able to do. They'd love to do many millions, but right now a million would say for the Europeans would be an ambitious target. That's 30,000 tons of steel. Now, Nucor, which is the surviving American producer, the big one, produces 20 million tons of steel. So is there going to be a shortage of steel constraining our ability to make artillery rounds for Ukraine? No, 30,000 tons is boutique steel production, right? So say you want to build an aircraft carrier. How much steel goes into an aircraft carrier? 70,000 tons go to an, into, into an aircraft carrier. Again, rack that up against production levels and you see just how fatuous the idea is that some lumpy piece of military equipment that you might need would somehow mean you'd run out of steel in the current configuration. Tanks, right? Another heavy artillery, heavy armaments thing, which obviously contains a lot of steel. An M1 Abrams tank, 50 tons of steel, right? So the United States right now has a fleet of 2,000. It doesn't actually make any new ones. The hulls are so essentially made to last. They just refurbish them over and over again. But say you did want to build a fleet of 2,000 tanks to deliver to the Ukrainians, it would take 100,000 tons of steel. Add all this up, at some kind of maximum cranked up level of heavy armaments production, World War II style, you might need two, three million tons, which would be the fr a fraction of one of America's current steel producers output. Now, some of this steel will be quality steel. And for that, there may be shortages, but they're not making that argument in this case. It's not about specific lines of steel. It's just some general concern. The fundamental constraint would be that all of this would take ugh, far too long, right? It would take maybe a decade to build an aircraft carrier, two years maybe to build a tank is, is the current speed of production. So steel is just not, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastical kind of chain of association type thing where you say we're in a tough new world in which we're inviting conventional wars. So therefore, we're going to need arsenals of democracies and arsenals need steel. It's, it's really sloppy rhetorical kind of reasoning that's going on here. So let's shift then maybe to one of the economic arguments being made to block this deal. Uh, namely, I noticed how various U.S. officials are arguing that, quote, good union jobs at U.S. Steel are potentially threatened by the takeover by Nippon. And I'm curious, how do union jobs at U.S. Steel even, yeah, how do they bear on this transaction one way or the other? I mean, would a Japanese owned company, according to this theory, be less likely to cooperate with or support U.S. unions or to invest in U.S. jobs? I mean, what is what is the argument being made there? I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's probably fair to say that American firms don't think of themselves first and foremost as investing in U.S. jobs, right, or supporting U.S. trade unions. That's not what they do. Like, whoever owns them, they're profit-making businesses, and they invest in capital equipment, and they do certainly invest in their workforce, but not because they support trade unions or good jobs per se, but because whatever strategy they're pursuing turns out to be optimal for them. So if you're in the business of retaining highly skilled workers as U.S. steel sometimes, is they will make concessions to their workforce as they did in 2019. I looked it up. They made they have relatively fam, re relatively generous family leave provisions, for instance, actually comparable with Nippon Steel's. Because I thought this would be the obvious thing to pick out, but no doubt Nippon Steel has much more generous paternity and maternity rights than U.S. Steel. It turns out in 2019, U.S. Steel had to concede those 
as a strategy for retaining its workforce. This is the sensible way to think about this beyond the political rhetoric about you know American firms supporting American jobs. Firms don't support jobs. Firms hire people for the purpose of making profit with their workforce in which they invest depending on a calculus of profitability for the firm. They can arrive, of course, at other sorts of compromise, but it will always be supervened by the question, first and foremost, of whether or not this is profitable or not. If you look at Nippon Steel's relations, labor relations record in Japan, as far as I'm able to ascertain it, what's interesting about it is that the steel sector in Japan is not a cozy uh, corporate union kind of situation in the way that some of Japanese manufacturing is. So famously, the auto industry has extremely compliant labor unions or had for a very long time. The Japanese steel sector isn't like that. The Japanese steel sector for a long time had one of the more confrontational heavy industrial unions. Its union leaders from Nippon Steel have been on the more progressive wing of the Japanese labor movement and have supported in the past the opposition left-wing Japanese party, which occasionally has been allowed to hold power. Uh, in Japan, much to the discomfort of hawkish American observers of the Japanese scene. So if anything, it would seem that Nippon Steel has a track record of living with a relatively assertive, aggressive Japanese trade union movement that will stand comparison with anything in the US. So, I mean, it is true, of course, that certain Japanese automakers operate non-union plants in the US, but they do so at the invitation of Southern American states, which guarantee them that they won't have to deal with the United Auto Workers, right? That's part of the deal. And those firms are in Japan as well, much more used to dealing with compliant corporate unions. So they opt for that choice, as do European producers, which back home in Europe have elaborate labor representation. Say the Germans have co-determination when BMW operates a plant in the United States. Of course, it's only too happy to dispense with that. But that depends on local American political backing from the Republican Party to enable them to do this. So I don't think there's any reason to think that a Japanese employer going into highly unionized American states like Michigan is going to start by picking a fight over the basic principles of labor recognition. That that I don't think seems like a plausible story at all. If you read the Japanese commercial press, you know, if you read Nikkei or something like that, you'll see just how sensitively and I'm just I can only read the English translations, but you can see how sensitively Japanese observers have responded to what they regard as a really rather remarkable kind of, you know, political effort to kind of blackball Nippon Steel. Yeah. So, I mean, finally, I I did want to ask how this entire potential takeover and the politics around it fits in with the Biden administration's overall economic strategy. You know, uh, I was reminded how Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has talked about friendshoring. This is basically the idea of turning away from open globalization and towards setting up supply chains with countries that are geopolitically allied with the United States. And it struck me that this particular deal seemed to be an example of friendshoring in practice, which I guess raised the question of why all the controversy? I mean, I guess I wonder, does this situation reveal that the concept of friendshoring has always been more fragile than it seems? Has it always been kind of vulnerable to more nationalist uh, impulses? I think the short answer is yes. I mean, it just reveals the whole thing to be uh, fundamentally inconsistent. And it's remarkable the Biden administration is not actually willing to stick up you know, with this one principle that it's outlined with regard to international economic policy. I mean, it hasn't, of course, yet, you know, go move towards blocking this. Um, as far as I know, there hasn't even been the decision to formally place it before the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. So it's in suspense, but the Biden administration is indulging this talk and rather than slapping it down. And America's allies will be reminded that under the Trump administration, the US actually threatened, well, imposed and then was persuaded to suspend tariffs on aluminium and steel imposed on Europe (laughs) as uh, um, a trade partner under the so-called Section 232 uh, provisions of American trade policy, which allow an administration to take action against um, foreign countries if they believe that their imports to the United States threaten American national security. And there was a claim made that European exports of steel and aluminium to the US, along with Chinese, threatened American national security and therefore tariffs should be imposed. The Europeans were obviously astounded at this this suggestion, um, which essentially conflates 
any foreign import or any foreign ownership of American assets or market share, if you like, with national security threats. I think what this indicates is that American debate about this, public debate, policy debate, is thoroughly irresponsible and unprincipled. And insofar as it has one, it basically consists of, well, we'll decide whether you're a threat, whether you're a friend, whether you're a national security risk, what procedures we need to adopt to satisfy our domestic constituencies such that this is okay. And the absolute prioritization, essentially, of domestic political concerns over relations with allies. We'll see how this ultimately plays out. The Americans are very happy to sell the firm. The owners of US Steel are very happy to sell this firm to Nippon Steel at an extremely attractive price. Nippon seems quite committed to the deal. It makes sense to them from a strategic point of view. But it's a pretty extraordinary display of the just sheer incoherence of American economic nationalism when the rubber hits the road. And it's very difficult to see why this should even be treated as the rubber hits the road. Let's just not exaggerate this as a deal. It's not like the Japanese are trying to buy Apple or something. Like it's um, it's it's not even America's number one steel producer. So it's very difficult. I mean, well, it's America's... called U.S. Steel. I mean, I think you're yeah, well, sort of you're getting... crying <laughs> out loud. I mean, clearly, there's a, yeah, it's a yeah, sentimental. It's, yes, exactly. Like Bank of America is called Bank of America. That is, that's just just like it's a. So it's it's silliness, right? I mean, appropriately, the managers of other American steel companies are applauding the Japanese and saying, "Thank you for putting a high value on these assets. We didn't even know we were worth this much." So, you know, I mean, that I think is probably the more reasonable response. I mean, I think it's a fitting start to a, a year in which, uh, obviously, there's going to be an election in the United States. I mean, I think that is when you say silliness, that seems that that's often the theme. But I mean, you know, credit to the Republicans, like Mike Gallagher, who runs the you know this the House Select Committee on Strategic Competition with the United States and the Chinese Communist Party, you know, the really hawkish folks in the in in the House, they actually recommended that Japan be placed on the accepted foreign states whitelist recently, just only a matter of weeks ago, saying that their applications for investment in the United States should be basically pro forma green lighted. So I think, you know, in the end, I, I would be extremely surprised if this deal doesn't go through. But it is, I think, embarrassing for the Biden administration that they're not able, exactly as you say, to turn French shoring into a principle by which they stand and to actually get out and do some political education on why bonding a frankly lame duck American steel producer to a more powerful and globally relevant Asian producer in Japan might not actually be a recipe for success. Yeah, I guess we're learning that uh, friend shoring is maybe less powerful a slogan than arsenal of democracy and all that conjures up. So anyway, we will see how it plays out. But otherwise, we will be with you all uh, again next week. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It's produced by Claudia Tady, Laura rossbrow Tellum, Rob Sachs, and Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested in news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Listeners to Ones and Twos even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TWOS at checkout. That's T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love getting your feedback. You can leave voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com or email us podcast at foreignpolicy.com or you can tweet us that's at ones and twos pod thanks very much for listening and we'll be back in your feed next week